By listening to this short ad, you are supporting our podcast. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it is the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There is creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Thank you. Hello everyone. In today's episode, we have chosen an article by a famous professor and author, one of my favorites, Walter Kaufman. This article is titled Solzhenitsyn and Autonomy. Walter Kaufman states, the cytophobia provides a revealing perspective for a look at Solzhenitsyn. What I mean by decidophobia is fear of the fateful decisions that mold our future. In without guilt and justice from decidophobia to autonomy published 1973, a book I dedicated to Alexander Solzhenitsyn. I have argued at length that humanity craves but dreads autonomy. Autonomy consists of making the decisions that give shape to one's life with one's eyes open to objections and alternatives. Most people are afraid of getting dizzy if they keep their eyes open at such moments without anything to lean on and have recourse to various strategies to avoid this frightening experience. Some lean on religion to tell them what to do, or at least to determine what is right and wrong. Others drift along either in the status quo, as many middle-aged people do, or by living a life governed by caprice, like the hero or anti-hero of Camus's novel, The Stranger. Two further strategies consist in allegiance to a movement or a school of thought. A fifth in exegetical thinking, which assumes that the text or tradition one interprets is right, so that one can read one's own ideas into it and get them back in doubt with authority. Yet another strategy is Manichaeism, which makes much of the need for faithful decisions. What stacks the cards? In effect, we are asked to choose between an evil tasting, poisonous dish, and one that tastes good and is good for our health. All good is on one side, all evil on the other, and the choice makes itself. A seventh strategy might be called moral rationalism. It claims that purely rational procedures can show us what is right and good. Another strategy is pedantry. As one is absorbed in microscopic choices, one is safe from fateful decisions. Obviously, these eight strategies can be combined in various ways. The ninth strategy is the faith that one is riding the wave of the future which dictates what is to be done. And the tenth, which like religion and drifting sometimes, spells total relief, is marriage. One can be married or religious without becoming a decidophobe. The point is merely that marriage can be used as a strategy for avoiding ultimate responsibility or faithful decisions. One can play all sorts of games with these 10 strategies, for example, by arranging them in groups, even before adding to their number. Some of them are ways of avoiding fateful decisions. Others are ways of loading the choices to make one option 
clearly the right one, thus eliminating all risk, while still others are ways of declining responsibility. Another game one can play is to give people points for each strategy they use. This can be done with oneself, which is a very good idea, with people one knows and with famous people. At some point, one is apt to wonder whether it is at all possible to score zero. What is at stake, however, is no mere game. The question is whether a human being is capable of autonomy. I think it can be shown that a few people here and there have achieved it. For example, to mention two utterly different types, Nietzsche and Eleanor Roosevelt, both are dead. Among the living, I cannot think of a finer example than Solzhenitsyn. We do not have to read biographies of the man, nor need we pray into his personal affairs to make a case for this claim. A large part of his life is, as it were, on the record, and anyone who wants to see the man and not merely the author can hardly do better than read Solzhenitsyn, a documentary record edited by Leopold Lavitz. Anyone familiar with this record will find it pathetic when students in Western countries plead that, in quotation marks, in our society, autonomy is simply impossible. Was it any easier in the USSR, and especially in Stalin's camps, or is it easier in China, or in India, or in Africa, in Poland, in East Germany? Was it easier in the European Middle Ages, in the face of the Inquisition? One feels like saying with Hillel, if not now, when? Rarely has it been more difficult for anyone to stand alone, utterly alone, without any prop of any kind, than it was for Solzhenitsyn, yet his life has been autonomy in action. For that alone, he would deserve our gratitude and admiration, even if he had not written several momentous books. In an age that has produced Stalin, Hitler, and their henchmen, as well as legions of essentially mediocre men who come close to destroying one's faith in humanity. He has shown us what man can be. Has he also shown us by his own example how to achieve autonomy? Can we follow the path he chose? The last question seems almost absurd, but one can learn to become a good mountain climber and to overcome dizziness by initially climbing with a guide and imitating him. What one can learn from Solzhenitsyn's example, however, is that autonomy is in some ways different from climbing. The goal is not that clear at the outset, and the path to it is even less straight. Solzhenitsyn spent three and a half years in the Russian army during World War II, then eight years in concentration camps, and then lived in exile, interrupted by two spells in a cancer ward. One could hardly prescribe that road to others. What is exemplary, however, is his keen sense 
that he is a survivor and the way in which he has dealt with it. Being a survivor generally breeds guilt feelings. Of course, we are all survivors, but most people do not think of themselves that way until someone very close to them dies. When such deaths are especially horrible or violent, and even more so when it is not only one person who dies, but large numbers and one witnesses their deaths at close range. The guilt feelings that issue from such an experience can be crippling. Solzhenitsyn had this archetypical experience three times over, each time for several years, first an army officer at the front, then in the camps and then in the cancer ward, instead of being crippled by the sense that he did not deserve to live when so many had died, or trying to repress and forget as best he could his memories, he made a fateful decision that is exemplary. He decided to do with his life what nobody who had not had these horrible experiences could do, and he became a writer. All of his writing is informed by his sense that he is a survivor, by a sense of solidarity with the dead. But his writing is never guilt-ridden or morbid. Instead of being overwhelmed by his cruel fate, he dominates his fate and makes it serve his purpose. He uses his experiences to do for humanity what but for that fate he could not have accomplished. This central dedication to humanity and to humaneness can scarcely be missed in his books. Hence the first circle and the cancer word are not depressing as given the subject matter one might expect. Chapter upon chapter bears the imprint of a strong mind with a purpose not to moralize but to expand and sensitize the conscience of humanity. There is something here of the ethos of Sophocles and Euripides who also piled suffering upon suffering to make men and women more humane. The comparison is doubly appropriate because Solzhenitsyn shares with them the fierce intellectuality, the intense delight in language and ideas and the mordant wit that survives disaster. What has here been said of Solzhenitsyn's solution of the problem of being a survivor is, of course, by no means unique with him. Other great writers have done the same thing, nor does the point apply only to being a survivor. Few people see that guilt feelings are incompatible with autonomy. Fewer still would opt for autonomy after seeing this. Just as most people dread autonomy, they are most reluctant to give up guilt feelings and try to persuade themselves and others that the alternative to guilt feelings is total amorality, if not sheer wickedness, brutality, and brutishness. If you have done wrong, they feel, you ought to feel remorse. You ought to feel that you deserve punishment, suffering, retribution. But if, in quotation marks, guilty is defined as, in quotation marks, deserving punishment, and in quotation marks, guilt feelings, as in quotation marks, the feeling that one deserve punishment, then it is not at all true that one cannot be humane after ceasing to think in terms of guilt or that guilt feelings are a prerequisite of humanity. This is not the place to recapitulate long arguments against the notion of desert, justice, and guilt. Suffice it to say that the case of the survivor is paradigmatic. When a surgeon has done wrong and it was his fault 
and the harm he did someone else was avoidable and he is responsible, it does not follow that he should feel guilty in the sense described here. On the contrary, his ability to serve humanity depends on his self-confidence. Guilt-ridden surgeons can be a menace. Far better if a surgeon gives himself a clear account of what he did and why, and then, like the survivor, goes on to do what but for that experience he might never have been able to do. Thus he might now teach others how to avoid certain pitfalls, and he might become wiser, more humane, more sensitive. This too is merely a paradigm. The point applies to everything that is widely held to call for guilt feelings. Being afraid of autonomy, which involves the resolve to consider objections and alternatives. Some people question the obvious point that an autonomous person could not have followed Hitler or Stalin if only one could taint autonomy by associating it with Amro Bruce, perhaps even with Stalin and Hitler themselves. One would have a wonderful excuse for not being autonomous. In the first circle, and cancer word, Solzhenitsyn has shown convincingly how an autonomous person could live under Stalin only in a camp or by keeping silent. How silence usually corrupts and how this corruption spread like a disease through the whole society. The chapter on, in quotation marks, idols of the marketplace in cancer ward makes this point expressly and at length. In the West, so many people are so ignorant of totalitarianism that they take it for granted that one could swallow Stalinism or Hitlerism the way one swallows any other worldview. And anyone who believes that American society is just as repressive as was Hitler's Germany or Stalin's Soviet Union obviously does not have the habit of examining objections and alternatives and might indeed have swallowed Nazism or Stalinism. Of course, one could be sincere and a Nazi or a Stalinist, but nobody who made it a rule to consider objections and alternatives could have accepted Hitler's or Stalin's irrational views and teaching students to develop an intellectual conscience and to make major decisions about their beliefs and conduct only after carefully exploring what speaks for and against various alternatives without any appeal to authority would have been a recipe for death. One did not have to be a teacher simply to ask such questions openly or to encourage others to become autonomous instead of simply accepting what the leader had said was enough to become a martyr. Few people have ever been autonomous or had the keen intellectual conscience that autonomy requires. Only those who fail to see this could possibly suppose that some of Hitler's or Stalin's followers were autonomous. The party line kept changing and the followers were required to change their views overnight, again and again and again. If they believed that whatever the leader did was best, that he knew better than anyone else, and that whatever the latest edition of the great encyclopedia in capitals said was true, they could escape terrible qualms. But in that case, 
they were the side of Forbes and not autonomous. It might be objected that we cannot reasonably expect people to say, like Job, quotation mark, till I die, I will not part from my integrity, end of quotation. In the Force de Chusset, 1963, Simone de Beauvoir, though merciless in her self-accusations, said of those who followed Stalin, quotation, they had to live, they lived, end of quotation. She repudiated anyone's right to judge them. But whatever one may think about that, the point here is not to pass judgment. The point is that anyone who gave up intellectual integrity to save his life, if only to preserve himself for the sake of his family, did give it up. After all, that is one of the differences between Solzhenitsyn and millions of others. They did, and he did not. He was autonomous, and they were not. An autonomous person decides for himself, not capriciously, but by considering with his eyes open what speaks for and against alternatives. Now it might still be asked whether a person might not decide after weighing the pros and cons to join, in quotation marks, the party. He might, just as a person might, decide to go to a surgeon and ask him, please, I cannot take it anymore. Give me a frontal lobotomy. Those who decide to commit themselves in such a way that henceforth they will never have to face faithful decisions anymore are decidophobes and not autonomous. And those who abandon or sacrifice their intellectual integrity cannot be said to have retained it. The Nazis and Stalin, of course, understood this very well and realized that there was no place in their societies for autonomous human beings. The Germans had a name for their principle. They called it the Führer Prinzip, the leadership principle. Rudolf Huss, the commanding officer of Auschwitz, gave a good account of it in his autobiography. His definition, quotation mark, every German had to submit unconditionally and uncritically to the leadership of the state, end of quotation. And this involved, quotation, surrender of one's own will, end of quotation. In the same vein, he spoke of Himmler, quotation, whose orders, whose utterances had been gospel for me, end of quotation, and called him, quotation, the most extreme representative of the Führer Prinzip, end of quotation. Another revealing remark is this, quotation, after such talks with Eichmann, human feelings almost seem to me treason against the Führer, end of quotation. Hitler himself, of course, was not autonomous either. He was not only singularly dishonest, but also quite lacked the habit of subjecting his irrational convictions to critical examination. He was the type Sartre has described in his portrait of the anti-Semite, English in my existentialism, from Dostoevsky to Sartre and Eric Hofer in The True Believer. He could not tolerate disagreement and in the end became more and more interested in astrology. As for Stalin, the classical portrait of the man is Solzhenitsyn's in the first circle. Plato had argued long ago in his Republic that the despot was not a free man, but at heart a slave. And he had argued elsewhere that Socrates was a free man, even in prison. Solzhenitsyn has developed both points at length and lent substance to the claim about the despot. Some have called his portrait of Stalin a caricature. I am in no position 
to judge its historical accuracy, but the portray rings true. It is a two defaults of genius and should not be dissociated altogether from its context. What Solzhenitsyn shows compellingly, and what is surely true, is that at each echelon in a totalitarian state, one looks up to someone higher in the system who has one's own fate in his hands and looks autonomous. But in fact, they are all unfree, all in terror, all depending on one's point of view, either pathetic or contemptible. And in the last analysis, both the wretched film based on the first circle caught at least a little of this point, but quite missed its counterpart. In the film, only one prisoner stood up to the authorities with defiant autonomy, suggesting that it takes an almost superhuman hero to do that. In the book, the scenes that were emerged in the film are distributed over several men, and there is no suggestion whatsoever that they are superhuman heroes. Solzhenitsyn suggests forcibly that simple people can have and sometimes do have the requisite integrity. This does not mean that it is easy to be autonomous, but Solzhenitsyn sometimes suggests that it was easier in the camps than outside. This looks paradoxical, but basically the reason is the same why it was easier for Jews than Gentiles to be autonomous in Nazi Germany. What was needed was a thoroughgoing rejection of the authority of those in power, an uncompromising refusal to accept their views uncritically, a raw independence of judgment to maintain that stance as long as one had a job somewhere in the system was more difficult by far than it was for those who were beyond doubt outsiders. One of Solzhenitsyn's major novels, August 1914, may seem to bear little or no relation to our theme, but in fact those who have written about this novel have missed much of its thrust, and our perspective may make possible a better understanding of it. I began by listing 10 strategies of decidophobia, and one was that belief that one rides the wave of the future. In 1940, Anne Morrow Lidenberg published a short book called The Wave of the Future, defending an isolationist position. Quotation, the wave of the future is coming, and there is no fighting it, end of quotation, she said, page 37. But those who claim to discern the future are often wrong, and an autonomous person might well say, even if this should be the wave of the future, I choose to go down fighting it. Sartre, among many others, has called Marxism, quotation, the philosophy of our time, end of quotation, and evidently felt that this endowed it with some special authority. If any particular world view were the philosophy of our time, many people would feel that it was no longer necessary to examine alternatives, and what speaks for and against each. For similar reasons, people turn to astrology, oracles, the Chinese I Ching, to help them decide what to do, or to find out what will happen anyway, regardless of what we do. Millions find it frightening to face up to the lack of necessity in human affairs. For the Soviet writer's secretariat, which considered Solzhenitsyn's Answer word, unpublishable as written 
they were generous with offers to help him rewrite it. One of the major provocations was the concluding image of the novel, an evil man throw tobacco in the macaque Reese's eyes, just like that, dot, 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 end of quotation. The provocation was not merely that Stalin was likened to an evil man, but that the author implicitly denied the Marxist philosophy of history and insisted on the element of caprice in human affairs. One does not have to be a member of the Soviet writer's secretariat to be dizzied by the thought that what some individuals decide, just like that in quotation marks, might be determined the misery and death of millions. To avoid this dizziness, people have always found it tempting to believe in a divine government, the stars or history in quotation marks. Solzhenitsyn's opposition to all forms of historical determinism is central in his August 1914. Here he develops a view of history that stands squarely opposed to Marxism and to that quotation Tolstoyan philosophy with its worship of passive sanctity and meekness of simple, ordinary people end of quotation, which one of his Soviet detractors had found in his early work. For obvious reasons, the polemic against Marxism is not formulated explicitly, but Tolstoy's ideas about history are rejected expressly. The subtlety and richness of this novel cannot be discussed here, but the points that bear on autonomy can be stated succinctly. In the first part of August 1914, the author shows how decrypt, obsolete, and hopeless the Tsar's army was. Soon one feels that there is no need to go on in this vein. The disastrous Russian defeat at Tannenberg was overdetermined, and any one or two of the endless reasons mentioned would have been enough. The reader is led to feel that it did not require the superlative efficiency and technological superiority of the German army to defeat such a rich force. But then Solzhenitsyn tries to show that if the celebrated German victors Hindenburg and Ludendorff had been obeyed the Russian army would not have been encircled and destroyed. The shattering Russian defeat was accomplished by two German generals who disobeyed orders and the Russian officers who defied their stupid orders and fought courageously inflicted serious defeats on the Germans and broke through the encirclement. Solzhenitsyn calls upon his readers to reject the false faith in the wave of the future and to make decisions for themselves fearlessly. Yet Solzhenitsyn is far from feeling contempt for those who lack the rare qualities required for successful insubordination and autonomy. His compassion for the sufferings of the less gifted sears the heart. In August 1914, the novel, his sympathetic portrayal of General Samsonov, the commander of the encircled Russian army, becomes one of the glories of world literature, precisely when we are shown how a severely limited man dies from the inside out, how despair and death permeate his body. Had Samsonov been more independent, defying his orders, he might have avoided defeat 
and failure, but he had some sense of decency, courage enough to wish to die with his troops and when that proved impossible to commit suicide. And he did not tell lies. So Jeanetson's hatred of dishonesty is a physical thing and finds superlative expression in the overwhelming final scene of the book in which a colonel simply cannot keep quiet even though his explosion may not do any good and is almost certain to ruin him. Nothing in Solzhenitsyn's works is more obviously autobiographical than the description of the feelings of this man. But the same passion for honesty finds succinct expression in an aside in the early story in quotation marks Matryona's house quotation there was nothing evil about either the mice or the cockroaches they told no lies end of quotation autonomy does not entail any in quotation marks elitist scorn for simple folk but it does require courage and high standards of honesty and it precludes any difference to the wave of the future. Autonomy is not enough and there is much more to Solzhenitsyn than autonomy. I have here confined myself to a single theme, but in conclusion I should like to cite one passage from Cancer Word that may lend a little more depth to this all too brief discussion by suggesting another dimension. The passage points to a central motive in Solzhenitsyn's work. It comes in a discussion between Kostoglotov and a poor woman. It is tempting to quote much of it, but I shall confine myself to the main point. She says, school children write compositions on the unhappy, tragic life of Anna Karnina. But was Anna really unhappy? She chose fashion and paid for fashion. That's happiness. She was free, proud. But what if, in peacetime, men in caps and overcoats come into the house where you were born, where you have lived all your life, and order the whole family to leave the house and the city in 24 hours, taking only what your weak hands can carry, and your little daughter in a hair ribbon sits down to play Mozart for the last time, but bursts out crying and runs away. Why should I reread Anna Karnina? Maybe I have suffered enough. Where can I read about us? About us? And although she had almost begun to shout, still her training by many years of terror did not desert her. She was not shouting. It was a real shout. Indeed, it was only Kostoglotov who heard her. End of passage. It is easy to imagine that someone really spoke this way to Solzhenitsyn. In any case, that is a large part of the burden of his authorship to write about millions of people whose suffering has remained mute and not reached the ears of the world. Millions who have suffered and died under Stalin and Hitler and elsewhere. Legends who are still suffering. In the early 50s, Sartre and many others in France were arguing about two seemingly unrelated questions, whether it was permissible to admit that there were camps in the Soviet Union and whether the novel was dead. At one blow, Solzhenitsyn made these debates ridiculous. Instead of inquiring what might be the artistic form of our time or the wave of the future, he found people crying out to be heard. But as in a nightmare, in quotation marks, it wasn't a real shout. And the only one who heard was he. He gave the suffering a voice. That was what mattered 
the humanity of it, but to do that required courage and dependence, taking his own counsel, putting his autonomous self against a vast and all but omnipotent system. Being autonomous, he did not simply use all forms. He made innovations, but all that was incidental and to concentrate mainly on that would have been vanity. What was crucial was that he should no longer be the only one who heard the voice. Perhaps one must really understand that woman, as one cannot understand, her simply on the basis of a brief quotation, to love Solzhenitsyn and to understand his work. Thank you for listening. See you in the next episode.